Hello, good afternoon, the ladies and gentlemen. Welcome from Vienna to our autumn hearing meeting. It's wonderful to have you all here online. And yeah, I want to say hello to you. We have this time a very, a very special hearing roundtable with outstanding experts about the field of cochlear implantation. It's not only how to make good cochlear implants, it's to do how to make perfect implants or to make cochlear implantation better for the benefit of the patients, for the children we operate, and for the whole thing concerning cochlear implantation. We have, again, a wonderful group of experts. And first, please, some, some housekeeping things. Uh, please quit all other programs on your computer for the best connection. So this is very, very nice. Please mute your microphone. So this is also helping for us, although it's an in interactive meeting. And please name yourself that we, that we know where you come from and who you are. It's a big honor for us to know where our participants are coming, your name, organization, and the country. And as it is an interactive meeting, uh, please, well, we are welcome for your comments and questions and raise your hand if there is any question or any feedback you want to give to us. So this is very great. Please, the meeting will be recorded. Uh, our aim is, if we have some substantial forward going things that we have it on YouTube later on as we had the the other meetings also available on YouTube. So under hearing, the hearing word in YouTube, you will find all our last meetings we had in the last one and a half years. We started this series when the COVID virus rised up and about every three months, we make an extraordinary session. So what is hearing? Hearing is a group of experts founded in the year 2008 of about 30 big university departments concerning active middle ear implants, cochlear implants, treating some 10,000, in the meantime, maybe 100,000 patients uh, with cochlear implants, with a lot of experience, all those departments do some 100 cochlear implants a year. And we want to share this experience with you to improve all your skills, to have feedback, to improve ourselves, and to have a kind of a global consensus, how we can help as many people as possible in the field of implantation. So please enjoy the meeting. You see here the map of the network, 31 centers on all continents, mostly in Europe, but we are proud to have all continents covered from North America, South America, even Australia. And we set the standard already in the last years, there are a lot of publications about cochlear implants, about vibrant sound bridge, about rehabilitation, uh, about hearing and the COVID virus, how to set a cochlear implant program if you are a starter. And we want to help you and to interact with you in any, in any act concerning medicine, hearing disabilities, and cochlear implants. Beside myself, I want to, to welcome Professor Javier Gavilan from the University of La Paz, Madrid. He will moderate the session today. I personally have the honor to be the 
the president of this wonderful group now since four years. Then we see from Perth, Professor Daisy Tavora. She has a lot of experience and did outstanding work from Würzburg University, Dr. Anja Kurz, a really super expert in the field since ages, actually decades from the very beginning of cochlear implantation, oh, no. Professor Lorenz. And now this time the first in our group, you see him, he's, he's an unbelievable researcher. Please look at him in the Medline, Professor Sumit Agrawal from London, Ontario in Canada, not the London in, in Europe, it's London, Ontario. So please let's go on the journey for this hearing meeting now. And I hope you will have a lot of benefit out of this discussion. Please enjoy the meeting. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Balmy, for this uh, nice introduction of our third roundtable. And I would like to tell you the main objective of this third hearing group roundtable. We want, today we want to push the limits. You know, at hearing, the hearing group, we don't like good results. We want better results. We want the best. Excellence is the goal of all members of the hearing group. And with this idea in mind, we have prepared four topics for discussion today. They will be developed starting with a very short presentation followed by an interactive discussion. And I just right now would like to encourage all of you to ask any question you have through the, through the chat and uh, the presenters will be more than happy to answer your, your questions. I know that when you see the topics, uh, some of them may look too advanced and specific uh, for many of you. You know, we have a, a very expert group of people giving lectures and uh, even though the presentations are going to be on a very high level and may look a bit abstract, I will try to bring the discussion to a normal and more practical level. So stay there and remember, our goal today is to inspire all of you on your way to making it, it better. So to start knowing something about you, I would like uh, to bring up a tool which is called the Mentimeter. And the Mentimeter is a device that you can uh, use and answer your, the questions we are going to, to show on the screen just by using your phone. So please take your cell phones, take, take your mobile phones and scan the QR code that you have on the right of your slide or go to www.menti.com, introduce the eight number digits that you have here, A2595483, and you will enter into the Mentimeter. And once you have scanned the QR code or have go directly to the web page of Mentimeter, you will see a couple of questions that we want to, to ask you. So please take your phones, go there. And let me ask the first one. What is your profession? This is a very simple one. We want you to get used to the Mentimeter. And also, we want to have an idea of what's the audience we have uh, this afternoon, this afternoon in Europe. I, it's almost night in, in Australia. Uh, so please tell us if you are audiologist, surgeon, speech therapist, or any other uh, option you consider that doesn't fit into these three categories. So um, majority are uh, audiologists, as I can see, and uh, surgeons are the third after other professions. 
speech therapist is only 3% of, of the group. So with, with this idea, I would like to go to the main question of this Mentimeter. I want you to rank the following items in order of importance just to achieve the best CI performance. What do you think is most important? We'll go with number one. If most important is complete cochlear coverage, you put number one cochlear coverage, complete cochlear coverage. You put number two, to the second one you, you consider, number three, number four, and number five. So please rank from one to five what you consider to be most important to obtain the best CI performance in your patients. And the options are complete cochlear coverage, structure and hearing preservation, fitting of the audio processor, rehabilitation, and proper counseling. I know it may be difficult to make a, a real rank within these this five uh, items, but I'm sure you have one that you consider to be more, more important than another. And so just try to put them in, in order uh, just with, that we can have an idea of which are your main concerns. We only have 18 people, 20 people answering right now. We need a, a bit more because there are more than 100 people attending the, the meeting. So please uh, try to order these five items. And the moment we see a larger number of answers, we will have an idea of which are your main concerns, your main goal trying to be, obtain the best uh, performance with cochlear implants. Okay, so I think we can start showing results and the first option for most of you is complete cochlear coverage and then structure and hearing preservation and fitting of the audio processor are tie, tie, same, same, same importance for most of you. Rehabilitation is the last and proper counseling comes uh, in fourth position. Okay, it depends on, on, on your idea of best performance, but this is what uh, the people think, the, the attendants uh, to this round table think. So right now, let's move to the real core of this round table. As I said, we will have presentations, very short presentations, followed by a discussion among us and having your questions. So please let me take you very quickly without jet lag to London, Ontario in Canada. And we came here because there it is, Professor Sumit Agrawal. Sumit is Assistant Professor and Research Director at the University Hospital of London Health Sciences Centre in Canada. His research interests include neurotology, skull based surgery, hearing loss, cochlear implants, facial nerve disorders, vestibular disorders, so a, a huge field of interest. And we are really happy to have Dr. Agrawal with us in hearing since a long time ago. He will try to give us his view of how making it better is possible by synchrotron-based artificial intelligence for image processing. Please, Sumit. Thank you so much, Javier. Um, and thank you everyone for the really kind introduction. I uh, just wanted to thank our collaborators in uh, Uppsala, Sweden, um, as well as all of my lab members who helped uh, contribute to this project. 
So all of us are probably familiar with the Greenwood function that can map the frequencies along the basilar membrane. The only caveat is that we need to know the total basilar membrane length in order to use the function. Now, if we have a mismatch between the electrode frequency and the actual anatomic frequency of a cochlea, this can lead to problems with single-sided deafness patients, bilateral cochlear implant patients, as well as with uh, music appreciation. So in order to find this cochlear duct length, a lot of uh, researchers have used the A value, which is a single measurement through the base of the cochlea. The problem can be shown on the right. These two cochlea have the exact same A value, but on the left, you can see a very big apex, and on the right, a very small apex. So vastly different cochlear duct lengths, despite having the same A value. A lot of researchers have modified the A-value formula, especially Daniel Scherzig and Marcus Peach with their ECA and cochlear scaling models. And, and although they're much more accurate, they still have problems at the apex if we just use basal measurements. Stakovskaya uh, attempted to use uh, two-dimensional histology slices to map the cochlea, uh, but this was not individualized. Her uh, formula assumed that every cochlea has the exact same length. So our goal was to try to come up with a new formula that was individualized based on an individual patient's cochlear size and anatomy. So we took a lot of temporal bones to a large particle accelerator, a synchrotron facility in Saskatchewan, Canada. And this is a picture of a uh, cochlea on a regular 625 um, micron cl clinical CT. And these are the images that we got with our synchrotron imaging. And you can see that it approaches histologic levels of detail. Now, if we take these thousands of slices per cochlea, we can create these beautiful three-dimensional models. So this is a cochlea, here is the basilar membrane, the spiral ganglion, and all of the dendrites connecting the two. We're going from the high frequencies at the base to the low frequencies at the apex. And you can see most of the dendrites are radial, except here at the base, they arch downwards in a complex pattern. If we move to looking at the cochlear apex, the dendrites here arch upwards uh, towards the apex. And here we can see a large part of the basilar membrane in red mapped onto a very, very tiny part of the spiral ganglion. So if we now multiply this across multiple cochlea, we can come across a master map. So here's the basilar membrane. This is our spiral ganglion. And again, if we look at the low frequencies in yellow, orange, and red, they're quite large on the basilar membrane, but they get compressed onto a very, very small part of the spiral ganglion. So we took all of our samples and created these very um, detailed graph looking at the angular insertion depth versus the frequency. We had a nice variety of cochlea, like short cochlea down to 850 degrees and large cochlea all the way up to 1100 degrees. Um, this is published in IEEE this summer as an open access article if anybody wants to look it up. But to save you all of the math and derivation, uh, we developed a new formula. So don't worry about the numbers, but essentially if we have any point on the basilar membrane, we can determine the frequency by entering the angle and the number of turns of the cochlea, which individualizes it based on either a large or a small cochlea. The advantage is that it directly measures the organ of Cordy and it takes into, takes into consideration all of our corrections for the hook region, the helicotrema, and the distance between the lateral wall and the organ of Cordy. And we also did a pretty detailed validation uh, that shows that it outperformed the stack of Skya mapping in almost all cases. So how do we apply this to our actual patients? Well, we went uh, into a type of artificial intelligence called deep learning. And here we have a child learning how to identify these fruits. And what we do is give a computer a lot of examples and teach it to do the same type of identification. Now, if we apply to a cochlea, this is a three-dimensional model of a cone beam CT. And even though it's quite a nice shape, you can see it's quite difficult to discern the cochlear apex. So if we take these raw images and we feed them into a deep learning algorithm that we've trained on a very large data set, this is our output. And we can see just how much sharper the cochlea is and how well-defined the apex is. And what we can do is we can do micro CT on these same samples for validation to see what the ground truth is. And this is the micro CT on the exact same sample. So we can see our deep learning predictions are quite accurate compared to ground truth. So if we can extract this anatomy, we can now do a lot of extra types of analysis, looking at the mid basal plane, the mid axis, and determining the number of turns. 
we can then use a separate deep learning network to extract all of the electrodes and their uh, very accurate three-dimensional positions. We input this into our formula to give us all of the different individual frequencies. So how does this work in actual patients? We've done um, collaboration with our friends at the University of North Carolina, uh, specifically Kevin Brown and Meg Dillon. And this is just an example of one patient at initial activation and blinded. In purple is a synchrotron mapping and in red is a default. And we can see the patient did much better in words, phonemes, and in vowels. Um, and this is again with no adaptation, just at initial activation. And so we now have 11 patients in our pilot study and subjectively all of them have preferred a place-based map as opposed to the default map. And uh, we now have a randomized controlled trial uh, starting hopefully in January. So uh, next year, I hope to give you some um, uh, better information to see how this can be clinically applicable. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Sumit. This is a uh wonderful images. I, I, I saw them before, but they are really amazing. And to the audience, as I told you, these are real experts on their field. So I would like to bring the discussion to a normal people like, like us surgeons uh, or audiologists doing every day's work. So my first question, I will do the same question to all, all, the, all the speakers, is from the Mentimeter questions, Sumit, which is your number one, complete cochlear coverage, preservation, fitting, rehabilitation, or counseling? Oh, that, it's a hard question. Um, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, structure pre preservation, I think, is important. If you do sloppy surgery and create a lot of scarring, I think you're going to get poor results no matter what, no matter how much counseling or rehabilitation you do. So that would probably be my number one. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. I, I suppose that this was going to be your number one. So let me ask you a practical question. From your studies, you can say that it is safe to insert a, an electrode into the apical region of the cochlea? Yeah, great question. So um, at 720 degrees, the scale of tympani is about 0 0.6 millimeters. So a flex electrode can fit. But after about you know, 750, 760 degrees, it becomes quite narrow. So I think we can get into the apical region, into the first 30 or 40 degrees of the apical region, but not all the way to the helicotrema. Because at the helicotrema, we're down to about 0 0.1 millimeters. So it's a bit too narrow. So then you risk injuring the structures. So yes, okay. you can get into the apex, but I would say into the first 30 or 40 degrees of the apex, not all the way to the helicotrema. So that will be... A near complete cochlear coverage it, it, it will i mean the idea of complete is not just getting up to the apex but just at the beginning of the apex yeah and can you tell the surgeons uh, that are now listening to us uh, what are the most important points to consider when you want to insert an electrode safely into this starting part of the apical region so i think now that our image processing has become so much better with a preoperative CT scan, we know exactly what length you'll need to get to that very first part of the apex. So I think if in advance, you know what size electrode you need, you reduce the chance of hitting a lot of resistance and getting an incomplete insertion. So if you can measure initially that, what length do you need to get to 720 or 750 degrees? I think it would be choosing the right electrode. Great. I think we have a question from the audience, Professor Hagen is there raising his hand. Can you activate your microphone? Gordon? Yes, I, I already did. Go ahead. Okay. Hi. To Hi, everybody. Professor. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, after your measurements in the synchrotone, did you uh, have you a new um, idea on the on the length of your electrode? In former times, we always used the thirty-one standard electrode. We looked in more than 1,000 patients with a CT scan and we found no one electrode with a kinking. So 31 millimeters should normally fit in all cochleas. Have you a new impression with your measurements? Yes, yeah, ours is similar that I think a 31 millimeter electrode, I think fit in about 90% of cochlea. And in our clinical experience as well, uh, none of them had kinking when we used the flex -off, but you know, in about 5% of patients, we would sometimes have one extra cochlear electrode where we would get 
11 in and the 12th one just couldn't get in the round window. And that those are probably those 5%, 5, 10% of cochlea that are just maybe a little bit too small. And in those cases, if we had put in a flex 28, perhaps we would have gotten an easier full insertion and not had that one electrode that wasn't fully inserted. But I agree with you. For the vast majority, I think that 31 millimeters is fine. If cochlear, complete cochlear coverage is so important, it, it is, in my opinion, better to, to choose a longer electrode as a routine. Yeah. So if you said uh, maybe one electrode is not uh, inside the cochlear, it's not a problem for the fitting. And that's what uh, the University of North Carolina found with their data that all of their flex soft patients with the 31 millimeter electrode in general had much better sound quality uh, than using shorter electrodes routinely. So I think you're exactly right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hagen. Daisy, uh, do you want a apical region inserted? Do you want a, a, the electrode going into the apical region? Yeah, can you hear me now? I definitely, definitely. I think that uh, our clinical experience, uh, we we uh, is that as well. We use in Autoplan to look at patients who actually had a shorter electrode and they have poor speech perception scores uh, with the shorter electrode than with the longer electrode. Great. And you, Anya, you want also the apical region with an electrode, the long electrode inserted. Well, absolutely. That's what I'm going to present in a couple of minutes in my presentation. Yes. <laughs> okay. Last question. Arthur, what about you? You also prefer a long electrode? Sure. We have um, uh, experiments and uh, we uh, have uh, evidences that uh, time fine structure can be actually uh, conveyed, but uh, the uh, one a critical point is to have um, as deep uh, insertion as possible and stimulate according to tonotopic organization. Great, so I think we all agree that the, the apical region is important to stimulate. I don't think that uh, if I ask you, Sumit, if you, you don't, but if you have a hearing loss and you need a cochlear implant and I am going to do the surgery, Will you ask me to put a long electrode in, instead of a short perimodiolar electrode, or straight long one, or a perimodiolar? Uh, lateral wall, long electrode. Lateral wall? Long, long electrode, yeah. Long electrode, good, okay. So can you tell the surgeons here in, uh, in this panel, in this, in this round table, what are the surgical tricks to be able to insert this 30, 40% start of the apical region without danger? Yeah, I think it comes down to one preoperative planning. So you kind of know the size, but as Professor Hagen said, a flex soft works in the vast majority of cochlea, but I like to screen just in case you have a smaller cochlea and then you might want to put in a flex 28 instead. Um, so I think one is planning, uh, two is just uh, stopping at resistance and slow insertions. Um, I always coat my electrode in dexamethasone as well uh, before I go in the round window. Um, and yeah, and then if you do get some resistance to just not panic, come out a little bit, rotate the electrode and take your time. And typically you'll almost always get the whole electrode in. Great. And uh, is there any, maybe this is a question more for, for Daisy and, and Enya, uh, is there a better way to stimulate the apex? Is there a special way to stimulate the apex? And what do you think? It's, it's, we, we just stimulate like the rest of the, of the electrode. Do we have to make a specific stimulation of the apex? Daisy. Well, um, I think that we are still uh, learning how to do this efficiently, right? But uh, I, I'm hoping that probably Anya is going to cover uh, the anatomy-based fitting where we are going to be able to do this a little bit better, right? Because if we have the exactly placement of the lecture, uh, we are in a better place how to, to stimulate it. If we have no idea where we are. Good. So last question to you, Sumit. Do we have to measure the cochlear in every patient? And if yes, 
how do we do? Uh, so my hope is to have this one click solution where we don't even have to do an A value or rotate the cochlea or load it into Otoplan that, uh, or have an extension in Otoplan that becomes one click where you load uh, the scan in and with one click, it automatically does all the analysis for you. So it reduces the surgeon time, reduces the audiologist time. Preoperatively, you get the cochlear duct length and postoperatively, you get all the individual electrode frequencies as well. So I think uh, both the pre-op planning and the post-op planning are both essential. Great, thank you very much, Sumit. So we've mentioned Anya twice uh, coming next for solving my questions. And let me introduce you to the next speaker. Uh, she's Dr. Anja Kurs from Würzburg in Germany. And she's the technical lead at the Comprehensive Hearing Center of Würzburg in Germany. As you all know, this center is led by Professor Rudolf Hagen, and it runs a large hearing implant program covering all implantable hearing devices and conducts up-to-date research in multiple topics. Ania has over 15 years of work experience in the hearing field, and she's a very active member of the hearing group. And now Ania is going to tell us uh, what's the anatomy-based fitting. Anya, you can go up. So, so good afternoon um, from Woodsburg. Okay, so um, as we've heard already, um, we have now a lot of information and we've, we can finally find out where the electrode contacts are placed within the cochlea. So um, big topic is anatomy-based fitting. So for the first time, we can really find out where are the contacts. The way how we are doing it here in Würzburg is that we are not using synchrotron images, but I have some very motivated colleagues that are using um, flat panel computer CT images. So um, one of my colleagues did a publication, as you can see here, there is quite a difference in imaging, the quality of imaging that you're using. And this quality is also necessary preoperatively to determine the correct electrode length, but also helps afterwards to determine the precise location of the electrode contacts. So in our case, I'm really fortunate to have flat panel volume CT imaging with secondary reconstruction afterwards. So we, we have this kind of data that we can now upload to the software Autoplan and import the information to the fitting software Maestro starting from Maestro version nine. And with this kind of information, we finally know where the electrodes are within the cochlea. So by having this technology that we have now for a couple of months, we were asking ourselves, can we now improve the CI outcome with having this kind of information? So the study idea was to match the frequency assignment to the electrode frequency to achieve a natural tonotopicity in each cochlea. So we wanted to really find out what is the effect. So we were recruiting experienced postlingual CI recipients. And we were looking at results and applying anatomy-based fitting in single-sided deaf patients. And we are lucky to have a huge cohort of bilateral CI recipients. And in this cohort, it's not, well, there is the possibility that there is on one side a long electrode and on the other side, a shorter electrode. So you might encounter this that when you have bilateral patients, there are patients that have a preference for one side. And most of the time, it's the first implanted side, or that's what we thought, maybe the longer 
electrode side. So that was something that we wanted to find out. So we wanted to improve the fitting in this specific group by applying anatomy-based fitting. So our prod and study protocol for so to have a baseline testing to investigate speech understanding and quiet speech understanding and noise, um, doing some binaural measurements to determine binaural effects. We had a pitch matching task. We're looking at timbre and also did we wanted to pick up the sound quality by assessing by the assessment of questionnaires. So this was the baseline testing and then we did anatomy based fitting. So the patients, we started with this study about two and a half months ago that we have an SSD patient. And I'm showing you now the screen that we see as audiologists. So this is the information when we import the anatomy-based information into the fitting window by looking at the frequency bands. You can see the green dots in here. And this is coincidentally, well, we found out that our SSD patients, they usually have longer electrodes. They have a, a flex soft or a standard electrode length. And by doing so, you can see the frequency bands, the allocated frequency bands. So this, um, the sound processor usually starts at 70 Hertz up to 8,500. So by looking at this graph here, you can see, okay, the physical location of the electrode contact of the first electrode lies within the first frequency band. And that's good. So we applied anatomy-based fitting in a group of SSD patients and the initial acceptance was really, really high. So that was a good result. However, I would like to share now and discuss what we found in the bilateral population. So this patient here, you can see there, this patient is sequentially implanted. The first implant was received in 2014 on the right side. And here we have a standard electrode. The second side was implanted in 2020, and here a FLEX26 was used. The reason for that was that there was residual hearing, so it was decided that this patient receives a shorter electrode. So by using the information that we now received from Udoplan, we could determine where the electrode contacts are. And what became then necessary on the left side was to shift to shift the frequency band on the left side up to 250 Hertz. And this then ended with the result that the initial acceptance was really good. We could improve the subjective perception, the perceptive, the perception initially. However, there is another case that I would like to present. So in this bilateral patient, this patient received a flex 28 on both sides. Again, this is also a sequential uh, implantation. And what you can see here, this is now, these are the frequency bands, the way they were allocated before for baseline testing. At that point, we did not know where the electrode contacts were within the cochlea. In this next image, you can now see that the, ele the physical electrode contacts are somewhere else. And so by applying just the, bat and the button, do anatomy-based fitting, the initial acceptance was not there because the patient said, this is, the perception is now, it's now darker. I, I cannot accept the way how the sound is right now. So what we learned from that was that we really need to manually shift the frequency bands up, as you can see in this graph right here. So we shifted the electrodes up to about 150 Hertz on the left side and on the right side to 200 Hertz in order to have an acceptance, in order to have the patient who took the map and went home with it. So there is a need for fine tuning. So the results that we now get got from this first round of experiments was that when you have a complete cochlear coverage, the initial acceptance with anatomy-based fitting is quite high. When we are looking at bilateral patients, the interplay between having on one side a longer electrode and on the other side a shorter electrode is crucial and it can work. We had success with doing anatomy-based fitting by matching the longer electrode and the shorter electrode by using anatomy-based fitting. 
However, this is not working in all patients when we're still in the learning process of how we can shift the frequency bands then in order to have the flex 28 then in the right position. So from our experience at the moment, we say that complete cochlear coverage should be the aim. It is important to choose the individual's uh, electrode lengths preoperatively, and this, we should target to have the first electrode contact within 630 degrees to 720 degrees in order to achieve complete cochlear coverage. So that's what we learned so far, but the study is still ongoing and I hope I can present more data later on. Thank you very much, Anya. Uh, well, I think I don't have to ask you the first question, uh, the Mentimeter. I think your answer is complete cochlear coverage. This is what uh, were in your, in your conclusions. But let, let me ask you something going again back to the practical field. Uh, tell your, your colleagues, uh, audiologists, how difficult, how, how many effort, you, how much effort you have to put uh, in, in your experience when you start doing anatomy-based fitting? Well, we started quite early by just importing the data from Autoplan and just hitting the button, do anatomy-based fitting. And what we received was that there was a really broad frequency band for the first electrode contact. And this was a problem because this led then to um, a perception, a very low and dark perception of sound. And that's the reason why patients did not accept an anatomy based fitting, but just hitting the button for the first time. And that's why we started to really shift the frequency bands up to in order to cover about two octaves for the first frequency contact. So anatomy based fitting is a good thing, but you really have to think about does it make sense now the frequency contact, you know, how big is the bandwidth for the first frequency contact? So what, what, what would you be, what, what, what will it be your recommendation? Imagine you are talking now to one uh, audiologist that wants to start with uh, and try a, a, a anatomy based feeding. What shall he or she do? Well, I guess to start the way how we started also to just hit the button, do anatomy-based tweeting to you know, actually use the data that are coming from Autoplan. But then, as I said, look at the first frequency band. Does it make sense? How broad is it? If it is too broad, the patient is not going to accept the sound. So you have to really maybe shift the frequency band a little upwards, even if you cannot really cover then the 70 Hertz from the beginning. However, if our, name, uh, if our aim is to reach natural tonotopicity and, you, and your electrode contact is not in a region of 70 Hertz, so why should it then give this information? So this has been working for many, many years. However, we are now in the process to learn about anatomy-based fitting. And that's how we try to make the fitting better for the moment. Okay, Arthur, are you using anatomy-based feeding, and if you are not using, are you planning to use it? Yes, uh, I can actually uh, completely support what Anya just presented and, uh, and, uh, and said, and I think that it's uh, also a little bit of um, uh, wording we, we are using, anatomy-based feeding, uh, for me, is uh, exactly what Anya is doing. Uh, of course, this implementation, uh, this method of shifting the frequency is different what is the automatic implementation in Maestro system. So uh, both uh, methods are actually uh, anatomic-based feeding. And what we are uh, doing also for um, many years here um, at, uh, is uh, even without the precise knowledge uh, of uh, uh, of uh, pos uh, position of uh, electrode because of uh, autoplan, we actually prefer to shift this um, frequency, this low frequency um, uh, in uh, cases when uh, it was needed because of a uh, uh, short uh, electrode for any reason uh, and um, not um, available hearing in low frequency, acoustic hearing in low frequency. So, uh, so I fully uh, support what was presented. Great, thank you very much. Uh, another question, Anya. Is this ABF, uh, the anatomy based feeding, useful for all patients, new and 
previous patients or it's just for a selected group of, of patients? Well, I'm sure that there are other groups around the globe that started doing anatomy-based fitting in newly implanted patients. So we wanted to know, we wanted to determine the effect of doing anatomy-based fitting. That's why we started with the experienced user, users. However, we are now starting also with new um, CI recipients in, in programming anatomy-based fitting and, you know, you know, there are different effects that start during the first year of activating in CI. That's why I think it's difficult to really distinguish then this is the effect of doing anatomy-based fitting and this is the effect of something else, of just the brain getting adapted to the fitting, getting the brain getting to know the sound of a cochlear implant. Um, so at the moment, we do have the experience by, you know, programming anatomy-based fitting in experienced user but we are now also trying in new users. We can see, we can try to compare then the groups, let's say in about one or two years, maybe we determine that with anatomy-based fitting, if you have created a map like this right from the beginning, then speech perception is much higher right from the beginning or you achieve the plateau even earlier. That's something we need to find out. Okay, and, and what about children and uh, adults? Well, so far we have not looked into children. So at the moment, the experience that we have is with adults. Great, uh, Arthur, you want to something? Yes, uh, I think that uh, for, from our experience, the group uh, to really look uh, into the anatomic base fitting is uh, uh, the one with, um, for any reason, the shorter than uh, uh, standard electrode because uh, as we discussed uh, uh, previously uh, if there is a really full coverage uh, with the long uh, standard electrode uh, probably we are uh, in 90 percent in a good place uh, but uh, if we have uh, not standard electrode uh, this uh, 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 differences between anatomic um, base fitting uh, and uh, uh, default one uh, can be substantial Okay, thank you very much. The time is over for this presentation and discussion. Anya, thank you very much. And now uh, let me take you in this journey to Australia. Let's go to Perth. We came here, we came to Perth to meet Professor Daisy Tavora. Daisy is the head of audiology at the Fiona Stanley Hospital and the adjunct associate professor at the medical school of the University of Western Australia. Her research has been focused on the use of CI in patients with single-sided deafness and tinnitus. She's a member of the hearing and the hearing group is lucky to have Daisy among our remarkable experts. And Daisy is going to deal with another very specific topic, very high level topic, which is higher order processing. Daisy. Thank you, Javier. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, can everybody see my slide? Yep. Thank you. Well, it is, it is definitely a very interesting topic for sure. Uh, and I'm very great that the, the two presenters uh, introduced that this push the limits because I think that we all have this goal, right? It's very interesting though, because although we can see that we have no issues in terms of pushing the limits for electro designs, for surgical techniques, we are still very conservative when it comes to mapping, right? We are still using the very old uh, technique using subjective loudness perception to determine if, if uh, the map is good or not. We are still doing that. So what, what we wanted with, uh, with this project is actually, it's not that actually we, don't, we never used objective measures before. We have been studying this for several years and several techniques have been used to determine the thresholds in a cochlear implant. We are all familiar with, with ART, with auto-ART, with NRT, with ESRT. I think that the issues that we have with these measures is not, not necessarily you can get these measurements in every single patient. 
and that for men of them you don't really have a very strong correlation with outcomes. So we have been studying um, the possibility of using um, um, a cortical response to ensure that actually the patient is achieving the best outcome possible. So what you have on the screen here is what we have been using is, as I said, using cortical. And uh, to, to, to begin with, we wanted to know, can actually we use it? So the best uh, population to test that would be the single side deafness because we wanted to see if the brain is being activated at the same, the same way if you are using normal hearing and if you are using an implant. So the single side deafness population is the best one for you to compare. So what do you see on this screen is, um, is using high density EEG where we see that the activation, I'm not gonna go into details, but pretty much what is showing is that the activation of the brain, there is no difference in terms of pathway, in terms of morphology, in terms of latency. Uh, for for where you are comparing the normal hearing at single side deafness, so we could establish that we could use the the the, the cortical response to see if the map is well done, if it's well optimized. Well, it, how can we? But the question is, how can we translate this into clinical practice? Because nobody's going to be doing high density EEG to see if your outcome is good. So what we decided, we moved away from the single side patients, single side deafness patient, because now we know the technique works. Uh, can we uh, use the cortical in a standard cochlear implant users, which means bilateral deafness patient, and see if we can improve the outcome based on cortical assessment. So we did what you are seeing on the screen there. Here's a summary of the, the, this research that we just finished. We did cortical assessment, aided cortical assessment in free field with 180 medal CI users. And what we found is going to, it's going to be surprising for you and almost disheartening is that less than 40% of these patients, remember that they are all ex experienced CI users, we want to see if their implant is optimized. So they have all been uh, mapped using the traditional that everybody used the traditional subjective loudness scale. What we found was that less than 40% of these patients had cortical response for how they speech a signal that we were presenting in free field. I think that is it's quite disappointing to be honest, which means that 61% of these patients, they were very happy with their map, they were high performers, but they could do better. So that's what, was, what we found. Um, then what we did was what we did was there was in acute setting, so we did a speech testing, and then we did a cortical measures. If they did need some adjustment, we would make the adjustment to run the cortical again and, and repeat the speech test. So what we found, and that is what I really would like you to follow, if you can. What do you have here? That is the speech score for a phoneme score pre-op before the optimization. So we imagine that that's the pre-op. This is the post-op, long-term post-op before optimization. So you could say, well, this is phoneme score. It's actually pretty good. What, why do you want any more? But actually they can get more. If you look at this here, the, the third bar is actually, is this is the subgroup who had cortical response for how they speak signal on the first go. So you can see that there is a difference. They were doing better than the whole cohort. And again, when we look at the, the, the group who did not have cortical response for all the speech tokens, for all the speech sig signal, you can see that if you compare this with this, is lower. But the good news is, so we did the cortical, we remapped them based on the cortical response. The good news is we repeat the speech test on acute setting and they do significantly better. So if you compare this with this, you can see that they did significantly better after the optimization with the CI. So I think that we are pushing the limits. They can definitely do better. We cannot accept that the patient has plateaued at 50% speed discrimination because that's not the, the case. I think that we can get better. And the next step that we are is to development is actually instead of using an extra equipment um, where we are doing the acoustic cortical in free field, 
we are now using, uh, we just published this paper, we are using the electrically evoked where we use the MCL the stimulation, your money and you, and you record through the Maestro software, the cortical response. So that is uh, one of the, the figures that was on the paper that we just recently published. And what we wanted to see if it is the cortical that is electrically evoked is similar to the acoustic evoked and we found that it is. So technically we could go ahead forward using the electrically evoked cortical to push the limits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daisy. This is really pushing the limits. Now, uh, let, let me ask you something. Do you uh, already, did you already use any cortical measures to, to fit CI users? I mean, this is just uh, research or you're doing that in, in clinical practice? Thanks for the question, uh, Javier. Yes, we are. We have uh, implemented uh, because we have done actually in total 165 patients as a research project, including uh, a group of single site deafness and then this group of 108 conventional CIs. And these in our uh, in WA, um, we look after the statewide uh, audiology service and it was implemented in our service as the standard of care. Uh, because we can see that that is a, a, a huge improvement. So the project was funded as a translation of research and we implemented as soon as we got the evidence. So we Good. are using it to every single patient. Good, and, and like I asked uh, Anya, how, how can you uh, uh, advise your colleagues to use these methods? It's how, how difficult they are, uh, how much time they take, what will be the practical implications of using this? Again, that's a very good question, Javier. It's, you are absolutely right. It's not, it's not that easy. Uh, it does take an extra effort. It does take an extra equipment. So you are talking about um, uh, an extra test that you have to do. But what we are finding, Javier, is that if you, if you have the equipment, if you have the capability, and hopefully this is going to be widely available uh, with the Medell software, is that uh, is an extra 15 minutes that's probably is going to be very cost effective because if you optimize your patient very early on, and we still we are still studying what how early you can do that, you are probably are going to be decreasing the number of follow-ups appointments for patient coming back. Uh, because you are being very conservative and you are just relying on the acceptance of the sound to go up forward and forward. So I think that could be very cost effective, but we have not looked into it yet. Okay, we have a question from the audience, but before uh, you take, take this question, I would like to ask uh, Anya and Arthur if they are using cortical uh, measures or not. And if they are not, what is their thinking after the presentation by Daisy? Anya. Um, so um, we are not using uh, the cortical evoked potentials at the moment in clinical routine, but I have a very skilled colleague of mine who is just asking, wants to ask a question right now because there is a research project going on at the moment. So yes, we do research also in that uh, area, but um, well, maybe it's worse to uh, hand over, pass over the words to my colleague <laughs> to let her actually ask a question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, hi, hello. How Happy. are you? How are you? Fine, thank you. So, uh, Mrs. Tavora, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. For me, very interesting. We have been trying with the cortical potential since about uh, a couple of years, but we have been uh, recording them systematically at uh, children and adults with uh, cochlear implants with hearing aids and the normal and uh, different ages. And uh, we have the problem with the cochlear implant uh, patients, whether children or adults, that they have this artifact at the beginning. I saw it also in some of your recordings at the beginning. And this artifact, I mean, we do see a peak after the artifact, but this artifact would uh, mask the earlier waves. So if uh, in an adult P1 comes in this area of this artifact in children, I'm trying to look at the maturation of the auditory system with the cortical, but then I cannot judge on it because as of a certain age, the P1 is getting inside the artifact. So what would you advise? What to do about uh, this problem? 
Yeah, that's 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 a, a good question. You are absolutely right. Uh, the kids is definitely a little bit more difficult because of the the artifact uh, overlapping with the P one. Uh, have you tried the electrically evoked? Are you getting the same? No, we did not try the electrically evoked yet. But yeah, uh, I. My 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 feeling, I, I I cannot say that is is for sure, but my feeling is that the electrically evoked probably will um, be a better solution instead of the 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 acoustic. Uh, but yeah, you are absolutely right. It's a little bit harder with the kids because of the maturation of P one. Arthur, thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur. What, what's your opinion about high order processing? Uh, we, uh, I strongly believe that uh, this um, uh, performance uh, of high order uh, or the, the state of the high order processing should be taken into account during the um, uh, feeding of the speech processor. So we, we, we should uh, feed uh, more to the brain than uh, to the cochlea. Uh, and uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, differences between subjective and objective measures uh, as um, the experience and the change in uh, subjective perception is uh, very visible. Some very loud sounds with the proper training and experience can uh, be actually considered as um, normal sounds um, in a, in a training process. So, uh, so we yes, we 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 do believe uh, in uh, this method. Uh, we are now doing our research project. We also fighting with the artifacts and trying to see how to optimize the um, um, uh, recording and also stimulation. And we also are trying to do the direct electrical stimulation for, uh, uh, for recording. Thank you very much, Arthur. And Daisy, I didn't ask you about the Mentimeter, which is your first option from the five we had, complete cochlear coverage, structure and hearing preservation, processor fitting, rehabilitation, and proper counseling. What do you think that I answered? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, but just tell them. <laughs> so if I think I think that you, you thought that I answered um, uh, the sound processor mapping. No, I actually uh, answered um, the structure preservation because, listen, we can do whatever we want. If you have a very messed up surgery, you are not going to get any good show or anything like that. So I, I, I think that the structure preservation then cortical mapping. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was not in the in the in the list. Next time we put it, it in the list. <laughs> and let me ask you some a, a couple of, of short questions. Uh, it's it's the electrically evoked. Are they uh, they they can be used by with with everyone, or you 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 have just to uh, select a type of patients to to use it? No, you can use with everyone. You with can everyone. use absolutely. And how with soon? Everyone. How soon after the operation? you can uh, use electrically evoked to optimize the mapping. So Javier, that is actually a question that we are working on answering at the moment, because we, we do have a randomized uh, control trial going on. And one of the questions that we are trying to answer is exactly this, is how soon we can do that. Um, very preliminary and more guts feeling than anything else, because we don't have uh, analyzed the data. I don't think that can be too soon. For example, we did try a group at six weeks and what happens is that it, it, they have more problem with acceptance of the sound than uh, if you do it three months. So I anticipate that probably is going to be around the three month mark, but I don't take my word for it. We will answer this question hopefully within the next six months. Okay, thank you very much. It was a great presentation. And we will continue our journey and we will come back to the old Europe to meet uh, <laughs> Professor Arthur Lawrence. Okay, Professor Arthur Lawrence is the professor and head of the department of auditory implant and perception of world hearing center at the institute of physiology and pathology of hearing 
in Warsaw, in Poland. He has received the first award from the Minister of Health and Social Welfare for outstanding achievements in uh, healthcare. And he's a member of Hearing since uh, many, many years. And we are really proud to have Arthur in our group. He will try to make it better just using the ICF model and he will tell us what the ICF model is right now. Arthur. Uh, okay. Um, uh, yes, uh, talking about the outcome measures um, actually is uh, uh, important because uh, the best outcome measure should be somewhat proved. So uh, we need to actually uh, monitor the outcomes. And uh, this is basically so uh, uh, critical to choose uh, the proper battery uh, for doing the assessment. So uh, <clears throat> talking about ICF, I just want to acknowledge that this project actually was started uh, under the hearing uh, in 2016 and some step uh, has steps have been uh, undertaken uh, and uh, now uh, there is a um, project um, uh, ongoing project uh, about how to use the uh, ICF uh, for uh, clinical purpose for the outcome uh, assessment. What is the ICF, International Classification and Functioning Disability and Health? Uh, this is uh, uh, the scheme, uh, the, the classification based on so-called the functional model uh, of disability. So uh, here, if we are talking about the outcome measure, it is uh, really uh, nicely visible on the model that uh, we have uh, three domains, uh, the body structure and, and um, body function. So here we can place the functioning of the implant uh, because doing the proper feeding, we are um, uh, for sure uh, trying to uh, reestablish body function like hearing and we directly uh, actually uh, uh, influence the structure uh, of the auditory nerve. But there is uh, two other domains like activity and uh, participation. Uh, and these activities uh, are not necessarily the same uh, like a body function because the limitation, uh, the activity limitation and the participation restriction can be actually also influenced by environmental factor and personal factor. Uh, what actually uh, patient can uh, have a support with family, for example, and how um, the patient actually try to use uh, electric hearing or hearing uh, with uh, implant. So um, uh, an implant performance is not exactly a patient performance. Uh, so far, uh, so um, I just uh, try to do this uh, brief uh, summary of outcome measure according to the ICF. Uh, this is a, a simple uh, illustration that some um, outcome measures can actually directly uh, measure body function like uh, so, uh, like sound detection which uh, on the ICF is uh, the, um, uh, the category B uh, the code B uh, 2300 uh, but um, uh, some uh, can uh, some uh, traditional outcome measure like questions can actually address uh, activity and um, uh, participation and objective measures like um, uh, uh, ESRT or uh, ECAP or cortical uh, potential can of course uh, assess uh, body, structure, uh, body structures uh, or the reaction of this body structure for uh, electric uh, stimulation. Uh, I also uh, actually forgot to mention, uh, so I uh, go back to this slide, that uh, the part of ICF is also the categorical scale. And this is uh, to provide a unified language, uh, to provide a systematic coding, and to have a possibility to compare data across uh, different clinics. Because if we link our outcome measures to this simple category scale, no problem, might problem, or no impairment, might impairment, moderate, severe, and complete, uh, we uh, probably um, can use this language to communicate with non-audiological specialists, uh, 
to communicate with speech, uh, uh, for example, speech uh, rehabilitation uh, people, uh, and uh, we can interpret uh, our, for example, cortical assessment in this scale and say that from the cortical response, there is no problem uh, with um, transmitting information to the brain, or it is a complete problem and moderate problem. Uh, so just uh, to end up, the, uh, there are some goals now, like linking the existing uh, um, measures to the ICF um, and also translate some other uh, outcome measures, like, for example, uh, uh, cortical uh, assessment uh, to this uh, type of a categorical scale, they validate uh, these tools clinically and develop um, uh, tools for counseling and rehabilitation, because somewhat we should uh, distinguish between the implant performance and patient's performance, uh, and uh, sometimes use uh, counseling because uh, the uh, bad patient performance can be not due to the uh, bad implant performance, but to uh, some environmental factors or even personal uh, factors. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, it was uh, an interesting presentation, and I think we can discuss about this. Before uh, asking you, uh, we have a member of the panel that has not participated uh, more than for his presentation, so I would like to address this question to Sumit. Uh, Professor Agra, while I didn't ask you before because I didn't want to get you in trouble with audiology, and I, I felt you as a, sir, a co colleague surgeon, and if someone asked me about the previous topics, I will die. So let, let me go to something you can, uh, you can answer easily. Are you aware of the ICF and you use it or you plan to use it or what kind of outcome measurements you use? So you're asking about, what, about an anatomy-based fitting or you're using about cortical measurements? So what were you asking? No, about ICF. <laughs> International classification of functioning uh, and yeah, we, we haven't used anything like that. I'll be honest. So we don't really have any experience with it. Uh, Arthur, are you using it in all of your patients now? Like everyone coming through is getting classified? Uh, we try. Uh, of course, uh, it's still a research project uh, because this linking uh, of the outcome measure to ICF is not a trivial um think it is um, um it should be done properly due to the, some methodology um, uh, already existing and it should uh, um, th this linking to translating some measurements uh, even to this scale uh, i actually uh, uh, had one example on about uh, even the threshold uh, measurements which we can categorize. Um, uh, th this is the, the most obvious way how we can uh, actually conceptualize this um, uh, concept that if the threshold is uh, between zero and uh, 21, we can say that this is uh, uh, no impairment or this is uh, no uh, problem. Uh, if the uh, threshold is uh, through, through free field, for example, in cochlear implant users, uh, more than uh, 70 dB, it is a um, uh, uh, severe problem. So, uh, so this uh, should be uh, precisely done. And after that, I think the tools could be uh, uh, used clinically because ICF uh, seems to be too complex uh, without this uh, linking process to be applied clinically. Okay, Arthur, we have a question from Professor Hagen, again, can you, Rudolf, turn on your mic and ask your question? Yes, unfortunately, my video mode was inactivated by the host. We but, know, uh, we, all, we all know you, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> my question to Arthur is, uh, had you, of course, after CI, you have an improvement in the ICF level uh, in comparison to preoperative. But did you look, uh, is this dependent on the performance with a CI? Can you measure it with the ICF level? Good CI performers have a better level after C CI than others. Can you measure this with this uh, new classification? 
Um, the, uh, uh, I think that the best is to just to answer that uh, the ICF classification uh, is uh, like an additional translator of uh, existing outcome measures. Mm -hmm. So uh, we try to actually use some um, defined language and communicate with this language. If we are doing, uh, for example, this cortical assessment, uh, of course, the uh, very experienced uh, audiology can, uh, audiologists can assess if this uh, cortical uh, responses are uh, proper or no. But uh, if we are just doing the um, print of the results and we will give this uh, to the speech therapist, that would be really difficult to, uh, to find uh, if uh, this is okay or no. So using the scale from the no problem to, uh, to the uh, complete problem is an example how we com can communicate and give this um, uh, knowledge of different uh, function of the brain structure and also uh, other structures and uh, um, hearing function uh, and communicate between uh, um, different professionals. Uh, that's why ICF was actually uh, proposed. And if we are doing everybody in the same way, we can of course compare the, uh, uh, the results uh, between um, clinics. So this okay, is- Okay, Arthur, this Arthur, is the Arthur, right. Arthur uh, we all agree that, that we have to standardize results, yeah. but we all agree that we want our system to be the one to standardize. So what are the reasons to use ICF instead of others that are used by other people? I think that there are two uh, really main reasons. Uh, if we uh, are just, uh, uh, um, uh, just uh, um, see the ICF that it is based on a functional model of disability using the uh, ICF uh, gives us uh, immediately the holistic perspective uh, of uh, three domains. So uh, we can uh, try always to be uh, to mm, collect the outcome measures, not only specifically for, for one domain like impairment, like body function. We, uh, we should be aware that we uh, have another domain and we uh, collect uh, we should collect outcome measures uh, for the participation, activation, doing the particular uh, prompts. So uh, questionnaires, uh, patient reported outcome measures, uh, for example. So the ICF is an umbrella that gives uh, us a, a, a sort of a guidelines as how we should um, do the uh, assessment in the clinic and how we can okay. organize this uh, assessment. This okay. is uh, one thing. Professor Hagen. Uh, this is a question to all audiologists. If uh, I, it was really interesting, uh, the Australian uh, lecture. So if you have the chance uh, using C, uh, C, uh, this uh, E caps uh, very early, uh, do you need anatomical based fitting? If you see in the first or second day, everyone, uh, these, these curves are perfect. So do we still need a, C, uh, a CT scan after surgery? If you measure the e caps after insertion and you see they are perfect, then do I still need uh, a C, CT scan or anatomical based fitting? Can you speculate Daisy. about all, all these three audiologists, please? Daisy, you start. Okay, that's a very good question, Professor Hagen. Um, it's very interesting because even if you, I think that one thing would complement the other because the way that I look at the anatomy based fitting uh, is that probably we are going to improve the quality of sound more than maybe more than correct me if in all, any of the other ones have a different experience. But I think that they are not be based maybe not going to make a huge difference in the speech understanding, but more in quality of sound because of the this uh, pre uh, precise information that we are providing to the brain, right? I think that in terms of the cortical, I do not anticipate that it's going to be very different if you are using this, the, the normal map that you are creating or uh, anatomy-based. I, I really don't anticipate that the cortical is going to be different. 
But I think that's more the sound quality that's going to be better. Anya. Yeah, I agree on what Daisy just said. I think it's uh, anatomy-based fitting is about the sound quality. However, um, by using the ECAPs um, for you know determining if the electrode is now in the right position, I mean, I just we just try it, huh? So we give it a try tomorrow. <laughs> Good, <laughs> Arthur. I didn't ask you about the Mentimeter. Uh, the answers were complete cochlear coverage, so, so, preservation, uh, PC. So Rehabilitation and counseling. Um, I think that uh, I just put uh, really um, feeding. Uh, and uh, of course, I am aware that it is uh, important to have a complete uh, cochlear coverage and preserve structure because uh, if it is not, the feeding uh, cannot help. But uh, we can actually use the same. Uh, arguments in opposite way, even with a very good uh, hearing uh, and structure preservation and uh, with uh, complete co co uh, cochlear coverage, if we completely screwed up uh, the feeding, if this uh, feeding would be uh, very bad, uh, we are ruining, we are demolishing uh, the effort uh, of uh, surgeons. So uh, yes, for me, the feeding uh, was at uh, the first place. Okay, let me go back to the ICF. Uh, is the ICF model, it is, it is adapted for CI users? Uh, this is an undergoing project actually. Uh, so uh, what we are now trying to um, accomplish uh, and in this uh, 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 working group, uh, for example, Anya is um, also um, included. We are uh, doing uh, a, a lot of efforts that uh, we can uh, uh, just implement the ICF for particular groups or particular uh, uh, patients with cochlear implants and uh, make this, uh, this tool more uh, easy to, to use in the clinic. Okay, and, and the last question, because the time is, is almost over, uh, we all put rehabilitation, the last in the, the five items we rank. How does, we all know that it's important, but I mean, we consider the others to be more important, but coming back to rehabilitation, uh, where does rehabilitation fit into the ICF model? And I need a short answer. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, rehabilitation fits uh, as uh, actually um, is uh, in the free domain active can uh, because of the uh, auditory training uh, can actually support uh, hearing function, but uh, to implement some special strategy of communication, uh, we can. Uh, help patients to communicate, to listen, uh, to participate, and to be active. Thank you very much. That was short, concise, and clear. <laughs> and with this, we reach the end of this roundtable, this third edition of Hearing Roundtable. Today, we try to, to let you know that we need to make sure that our users perform as best as they possibly can, and that we try not to have good results, but to have excellent results. And for this, we went through a different kind of approaches. First of all, from Ontario, Canada, we heard Professor Agrawal talking about the synchrotron imaging that allows us to unlock the 3D pattern of the cochlea, and by doing this, we can create a patient-specific formula to determine frequency mapping across the cochlea. Then we move to the uh, German School of Anatomy-Based Anatomy -based Feeding with uh, Dr. Anja Kurs, which uh, uh, initial pilot data leads to improved clinical outcomes due to more natural tonotopicity. And another option, coming from the other end of the world, from Australia, from Perth with Daisy Tavora, uh, shows that mm, to improve user performance, uh, we can map the implant using higher order processing measured by EEG and uh, electrical evoked potentials. And finally, coming back to Europe in Warsaw, in Poland, 
Professor Lawrence uh, demonstrated that by individualizing outcomes, we can only make things better for our users compared to what they already have. So we have to speak a common language and this will uh, produce better results for uh, our CI patients. I know these topics uh, initially could look uh, too specific, uh, but you all should make sure that the rest of your team is aware of the importance of, of such factors in order to make it better. You, you saw the surgeons were not very active in, in this round table, but the surgeons must be aware that there are these things there that can help our patients. In other words, communication is crucial. And combining a patient-specific formula for implantation measured by individualized feeding and looked after on a holistic manner allows best performance for each user. And with this, I would like to finish this round table just by letting you know that hearing we are here to help you in any way we can. You have here two different options for hearing. On your left-hand side, you have hearing.com. This is our webpage. Uh, you will find quality standards, tool for experts, centers, profiles, and publications. And you will find always someone that would like to answer your questions, your doubts, that will like to comment with you any issue you have in mind. And then you can also move to boost.hearing.com boost where you can find certified courses all delivered by hearing experts. So a group of real experts in all kinds of hearing implants. And you can also get a certified accreditation for this round table. This is important, especially for, for young people here in, in the audience. Uh, you can get a free international CPD point, which will take like four or five, six weeks before it arrives, but, but you will get it. And if you want to have this uh, to prove that you have been in this uh, teaching event, you just have to request it by writing uh, an email uh, to this second webpage I, I told you before, boost at hearing.com. And with this, uh, you will have some more uh, value, not only the learning value, but also the practical value. Here on round tables are a thing that has been repeating all over the years. We do one every three months for a year. This was the third one. We will have the winter one, the fourth one of this year, second of December. And there we will deal with uh, the issues related to uh, pediatric uh, cochlear implants. And then we will move into the next year with spring, summer, and autumn roundtables. We would love to have you all here with us in the next events. And I would like to thank the participants. I would like to thank our uh, president, Professor Baumgartner, and I would like to thank all of you for being there. Thank you very much.